Hey, it's Norm from Tested. And it's Adam. And we are back in the cave doing something a little different today. Yep. Uh, we have the Blade Runner gun, your Blade Runner gun. Yes. Um, that we've talked about before. Mm -hmm. And today you want to build something to accompany this. I am, it's something that, one thing I ha we haven't gone over on the website is that I'm obsessed with boxes and cases. Um, I buy beat up old ones when I find them. I go and search them. I love things like, like, like Leon's uh, pistol case from The mm -hmm. Professional, something I've always wanted to replicate. Um, today, I'm gonna make uh, a shooting case, like the kind of case you take to the gun range for the Blade Runner pistol. I'm gonna include some artifacts in it that are from the future, from the Blade Runner, uh, and also Alien Universe, because in Ridley Scott's mind, yeah, they, they cross, cross over. Yep, Tyrell um, and Wayland. I'm gonna be using primarily a uh, quarter inch finish ply, some paper, some brass, and some green felt. You've already designed this in your head. I've been designing it in my head all week. I've made a few drawings here, some, some loose stuff, but uh, it's mostly I've just been putting it together in my head. All right, we'll let you get to work. Okay, here we go. And so it begins. And so it begins, yeah. Um, so at this point in a construction phase, I have some rough ideas of how I'm gonna make what I'm gonna make. Uh, and I just start cutting the big parts. For this box, uh, I'm actually gonna build it as a complete box rather than try and build the lid or actually the two lids separately and get them all to fit each other. That's an interesting design concept. You're building all six walls first. Yes. And then cutting the lids off of it. Um, and you, you planned this out, we showed uh, three sheets of paper. Yeah. So actually over the weekend you sketched out the rough, the, 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 the profile box. Yeah, I did. And, and usually uh, sketching out a rough profile for me uh, happens in a couple of different ways. Um, on, one, on one level I will work out what I think it should look like. And then I came into the shop over this weekend and cut out a piece of foam core that was the actual size of one of the sides of the box so I could really understand the relationships. For me, I can't quite build something until I completely understand it. And that's often means I need to build some part of it in scale. So here, I've got the gun sitting there and this is how I'm deciding on the final dimensions of what this box should be. It's all, all these things have to weigh together. Right, because the, actual, the gun has to fit and has to look nice when yeah. it's placed in the box and there needs to be enough space on all the sides of it. Uh, what type of wood are you using here? Uh, I'm using a, a nice finish ply, often referred to as a fin ply. Um, it doesn't have any voids. It's got a nice finish on both sides. Uh, it paints really well. Uh, it's also, uh, because it's multiple layered, you can see it's got like eight layers there mm -hmm. instead of a normal cheap right. plywood is like three layers. Uh, that means that when I glue and I staple it, well look, there's Joe. Uh, that means when I glue and I staple it together, the staples won't split apart the side of the, of the plywood. Um, you know, I, I could use biscuits and other ways to make this more solid, but I don't need this to be a hundred year box. Uh, the staples and the glue are gonna make it incredibly durable. And so that's how you're adhering those pieces together. We're seeing that you're gluing them first, mm -hmm. and that's just wood glue? That's just standard wood glue. Standard yep. wood glue, and then uh, fixing these planes together, and then using a staple gun and stapling along yeah, the Yeah, I'm using narrow crown staples, um, and I like to use them long. Uh, you have to be careful when you use these. Uh, this has happened to us in the, in the film industry. Um, some guns will double fire if you're holding them wrong mm -hmm. or even if you're holding them right. And they'll take a staple, drive it in, take a second staple, drive it into the first one and push it forward. Um, I've been bitten uh, oh, yeah. two and a half inches away from where I was stapling because the staple got pushed through and hit my finger. Um, so they're, they're, that's a pretty strong staple gun. Yeah. You're, you're also building, I mean, it's, it's a one-day build and you're building as just yourself. When you were building props at ILM, did you have assistants to help you or were, did everyone build as if they took on the entire project on their own? Um, well, that's a good question. It usually, for a small build like this, you'd build just yourself. Um, but, you know, if you were running a job, like for uh, Terminator 3 was one of the first jobs I was officially a supervisor, uh, I had a crew of like five people working with me uh, and it wasn't like they were my assistants, these are all my colleagues, and I'm just managing the project. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, okay, you go and build this interior part, you work on the lighting, you work on the painting, etc. So it's, it's the glue, staple, sand, yes, over and over again. Glue, staple, sand, and then that allows all the edges to be brought into some fine relationship to each other, so all the edges are nice and square. Now, I'm starting to mark out where I'm gonna cut this thing. Um, 
Yeah, this already looks like a box at this point. Yeah, and it's a real, it's, it's really sturdy. solid. And with with the with the glue, this is it's a very solid thing. And here I am again using the gun. To, I learned graphic design in the late '80s before computers became ubiquitous in in graphic design. And one of the things you have to do when you're doing a layout in design and people ought to do more of this with their computer, is you have to really stand back from it and sort of blur your eyes and, and see what's going on in terms of the relationships and the, the flow. The gestalt of the whole thing. Exactly. And that's what I'm doing right here. I'm, I'm really free-forming it, but this is the way I like to build. This is the way I naturally build. Um, I used to joke that uh, for most of my builds, I never use a ruler because everything's in relation to each other. Right. I'm like, oh, well, this is just this piece of plywood plus two extras for the ends, and I just frame that up on the table saw, and I don't you, need a ruler. You have in your head the optimal ratios right. between where the openings should be. Exactly, and you know, because from, a, from 15 years in special effects, I've got a lot of, yeah, see, I'm changing a line there, making decisions about where that line's gonna go. This often is my favorite part about doing this kind of thing, and that's actually where I'm sort of figuring out what the, backs, the, the backsplash behind the gun is gonna be. Uh, and again, I haven't worked through all these details yet. Now is the time I need to work through them because yeah. I'm about to cut this box and make some parts that fit inside of it. So you don't want to plan too much in advance because you know there's going to be some wiggle room. It's not even that I building. don't want to plan too much in advance. It's that I can't. Okay, so now this is one of my favorite tools. This is a Japanese woodworker saw. I've got about five of them. Uh, it's a gorgeous tool. are for different, different types of cuts. Um, the thing that's remarkable about these saws is, one, their fineness. They're incredibly thin. So the kerf, and that is the width of the cut that they make, is incredibly thin. You're not getting a lot of sawdust and a lot right. of lost material. I could use a jigsaw to do this, but the moment I did, the jigsaw's kerf would actually make the lids, the parts of these lids, far apart enough where they might not marry mm -hmm. really closely. The second thing, that, oh, this is a different Japanese saw. The second thing that the saw does is it cuts on the pull instead of an American saw which cuts on the, the push. push. The fact that it cuts on the pull gives you a tremendous amount of fine control over where you're cutting and staying on a line. It is a, it, it, they're just beautiful tools and I use them all the time. Now, for the cut of the whole two top lids, I can use the jigsaw because that kerf, the whole thing's just gonna drop down the width of right. that saw blade. So you're using that Japanese saw just for the parts where the lids match, where you're not gonna have any hinges and where you need where you need a perfect a match of the, of the two materials, okay? Exactly, exactly. Uh, and these are the kind of shortcuts and efficiencies. I'm using a really thin blade here so that when I turn the saw, I'm not actually ending up with a big void there. Um, and, you know, for a jigsaw, I love have I have like 200 blades. I, I hate running out of stuff. I hate working on a Sunday night at 9 p.m. and yeah. I break a blade and it's the last one I've got like that. So I always make sure I've got like every possible blade and combination of blade, metal, wood, thick, thin, fine finish, rough finish that I need. It's about being prepared. Yes. So there you go, you can see the top lid. Now I'm gonna cut this. Again, because of the way I've done it, I can actually use the jigsaw and its kerf doesn't really matter. And then beautifully, this and one box now becomes a box and two lids. Yeah. And because I've made the whole thing contiguously at the beginning, I know these parts fit together just perfectly. Now I'll do some final cuts with the finish saw, uh, and there'll be almost no gap when I put them all together. Let's, let's talk about the design of this box with the okay. two lids. Where does inspiration from that come from? Um, so <laughs> there is a type of... Uh, uh, how do I put this? Okay, so uh, people who have pistols and go to the shooting range all the time will often have a shooting case. Um, shooting cases uh, often have a front part of the box that's like, it'll be shaped kind of like the box that I'm making, large rectangle, and they'll have a handle on top. But instead of opening on the top, it'll actually open in the front. And there's a famous kind called a pachymar, I'm not sure that's exactly how you pronounce it, <laughs> called a pachymar that I covet and I really like. And it looks a little like Leon's gun case from The Professional. Right which is a case I covet and want to build. <laughs> it is one of my, it was one of my prop projects that I want to make. Um, the, the right box for the right gun. The right box for the right gun. So uh, it, I was following the kind of rough size of a Pachymar case, uh, except where those usually hold five or six guns, mine only holds one because it's, it's also kind of a display throne for the Blade Runner gun. It's a, it's a throne and also functional, you can actually carry the prop around. Exactly. Um, 
And, and earlier we saw that you uh, you had some of the, the hinges and the corner pieces, those ornamental pieces. Um, so you're already thinking in your head that you might get those, those later to prepare those. Exactly. And there may need, need to be things that I want to do with those. Like, for instance, here's the butterfly closer hardware. I know that because I'm using black paper to put this together, I'm going to want these to be black. So I'm hitting them with a matte black uh, lacquer-based primer, actually made by Plastic Coat. That's with a K. Um, and it's great stuff. Now I'm attempting to weather some of my brass parts using acid. This is acid that you use for patinaing things. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm going to discover very quickly though is that because, and I kind of knew this, I just wanted to see if the acid would eat through it. Um, these parts are all sent from the factory with a lacquer coating on them. So the acid won't go through it. With the coating. Yeah. yeah. It needs to have direct contact with the metal. Right. And, you know, these parts are the kind of parts that would lose their coating over many years of mm -hmm. use. Um, I don't have time to make them lose their coating. So uh, I'm, in a few minutes, going to use a blowtorch to just discolor them. Yeah, so right now you're just picking out hardware from your, you have lots of hardware on your shelves. Well, I've been obsessed with boxes for a few weeks now and one of the ways that I've been dealing with that is I've been going to hardware stores and picking up lots of little chunks and baubles and pieces of box hardware. I've also been on Amazon looking at pieces. Here, you know, first I thought maybe I'd weather it by hitting it on a sanding wheel, on a, on a, on a wire wheel. Then I thought, okay, I'll paint it black because that's what it should be and then I'll weather that back. The nice thing about the black spray paint is you can add weather patterns in. So here's the blowtorch. Now I'm discoloring these and they discolor really nicely. Um, and that's just a regular blowtorch. That's just a regular propane you torch. You know that, yeah. you know, it's not going to melt and it's going to, you're going to get that really nice bluing. Exactly. All right, so now I've got these parts cut out to receive the butterfly closures. Uh, it's a little bit, it's a little bit tricky at this point to figure out what order you want to do everything in. Mm -hmm. uh, especially since I like to work fast, it's easy to get ahead of yourself. Um, the most fun part of this project for me is going to be putting on the paper later. Yeah. But I can't put on the paper until everything else is in place. You really have to be careful. So here is the paper. Um, now, there is a type of material of vinyl called Tolex, which uh, people who restore amplifiers use, and it's that, that mottled it's, it's thick. vinyl on an amp. Yeah. Um, this is more like a kind of a moleskin notebook covering. And I've always, I've been meaning to go to the art store for years and ask, do you guys carry this stuff? Because I love the look of moleskin notebooks. Mm -hmm. uh, and lo, I went to Flax uh, yesterday morning, the day before I did this, and asked them, and they totally had everything that I needed. And it's just textured paper. It's, it's just not leather. Paper. Yeah. And it will tear like paper. And, but paper affixed to, you know, taped onto, uh, glued onto wood, yeah. will look like a whole different type of material. Absolutely. Uh, and it'll have that leather look. It'll feel like a doctor's bag. So here, obviously, I want to wrap the paper around the corner. So I've cut it large by an inch. I haven't been really exact. You can see on the left, it's a little taller than on the right. That's not going to make a real difference once I put the face paper on. I didn't know that before I did this, but I was gratified to see that your eye didn't like pull it out as, oh, that's not as nice as I thought it right. should be. Uh, so the spray I'm using is a, uh, a spray on contact cement. Uh, it's called the Super 77. I also use regularly one called Super 74, which is specifically for foam. This stuff is like crazy glue. One of the one of the driving forces of the special effects and prop industry. Uh, it allows really quick application of, of contact cement. It is not the most durable of glues, but it doesn't necessarily have to be, especially mm -hmm. for something like this. You have a wide surface area anyway. Right. Now, one of the tricky parts about applying this paper is you've got to do it really evenly because once you've stuck it, you're not going to get it unstuck. You only have one chance to get this right. That looked really simple, but uh, it's also because I've been I've been gluing things to other things like this uh, for years. And it's easy to it, imagine air bubbles or getting a crease in that. Air paper. bubbles are okay, but a crease, crease. will kill uh. you. So now I'm just doing some of the fine finish edging. Oh, oh okay. This yeah. is cutting out the drawer, yeah. and this is actually a tricky part because I had forgotten about the drawer. I got yeah. a little ahead of myself. Yes. Now that is going to that piece I cut out is going to end up being the front piece of the drawer, uh, and I had to use the uh, the the jigsaw and I used the kerf of its blade to actually make that drawer have the right spacing. Um, and you cut out that front. You had to actually peel off the paper that you had, yeah. had glued on previously because I'm going to put on a different kind yep. of paper. So now I'm making the drawer, and I'm making it a standard drawer technique, which is 
uh, I cut a little groove in the uh, in the sides mm -hmm. of the drawer, uh, so the bottom piece floats, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a standard drawer construction. Anyone who's built IKEA furniture would recognize this. Absolutely. Um, now I'm cutting out the uh, a hole for the hardware, which is going to go. And I found this really nice brass door pull at the uh, Center Hardware here in San Francisco. Uh, and in order to sink it flush against the surface of the drawer, I'm using my mill. There's the piece of hardware I found. Again, I'm discoloring it so it looks like it's old. I use my milling machine to mill out a, a pattern that fits it so it sits flush with the drawer. And then there you go, applying here I that. Go. I put it in that paper and it, it fits almost almost perfectly. And, and doing this kind of thing when you when you finally put the piece in and it fits, that, that yeah. always makes me really happy. Like that's, that's, you know, I'm like, at this point in my head, I'm like, yay, <laughs> it looks great. You're building the pieces of your own puzzle and then the puzzle pieces fit. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, and oftentimes that can be, oh, okay, so now I'm gluing in some drawer slides and I'm using uh, styrene to actually come out from the walls in order to guide the drawer yeah. in. So I have can, styrene on the base and on the sides. Yeah, now I'm using styrene because it's, uh, it's, it's low friction uh, and it's a quick solution here. I could use wood and plane it down to the thickness I need, but I'm super impatient. Uh, and I'm gluing the styrene with a weld bond called Weld On 3. Now you can see also that the drawer fits, but uh, because I had to cut out the paper on that left side, I'm gonna have to reapply paper to that whole left side in a few minutes. Uh, so, you're, yeah, on the lid of the drawer, you actually have to pad it a little bit more. Exactly, exactly. I, I want that extra space between the drawer top, the drawer, the, the drawer front, and the other pieces. So now I'm attaching the paper again to a lid. I was actually surprised uh, in doing this at how long it took. I mean, I told you guys when you showed up that this is going to be like a three-hour build, and it yeah. turned into a seven and a half right. hour build. I mean, a lot of it's a detail work. You want to get all those lines perfect and. It really, when you look at the edges of that box where, where the seams are, you can't see where the, the, the paper does yeah. not look off. Yeah, it disappears parallel. quite nicely. Um, I also love looking at a project in this stage where you can see how rough it is around the edges. Taking care of that roughness, um, one of the phrases we use in effects is we call it hiding the crimes. Uh, taking care of that roughness is one of the real tricks of a craftsman. Knowing when you have to be super precise and knowing when you can kind of let it go because there'll be another detail later that covers that over. And when you're building something for the camera, you, you know the camera's only going to see something at certain angles. But when you're building something for yourself, you know, there's things that people will notice first and things that you can't unsee. Exactly right, exactly right. So now I'm cutting some more wood for the structure that's going to go inside the box. Uh, and this is the stuff that will, uh, one, provide a top for the drawer. Um, this will be the stand that the gun sits on, and it will end up being the compartments of the secret compartment that's in the case. And so you, you knew going into this, when you sketched it out in your head and on paper, that you would have compartments, and it wouldn't just be a display case. You would also have a drawer and secret compartments underneath the display. I knew I wanted a secret compartment. I didn't know I was going to have multiple compartments until I got to this stage, mm. and I realized I needed, to, I needed it to have more uh, structure to it that the gun was going to sit up there, and so I needed some, I needed some fins to support it. And, and here's where, where you had to do some geometry in your head to get the angles right for, for getting that in. Exactly, and this is actually some of the trickiest part of doing this because that insert is actually a pressure fit inside the box, and making it that precise, that's just experience. That's just like, you know, knowing where you can fudge and where you don't need to fudge. I was really pleased with how well that all fit together. So now I'm taking what's called, uh, what you normally call piano hinge, mm -hmm. um, and I'm cutting it to the exact length I need with my favorite tool, the porta band. That's such a massive tool for such a simple cut. It's so nice and quiet. <laughs> That's a Milwaukee cordless tool, and I swear I'd make lunch with that thing if I could. I just love it. Okay, so it's just, you're just riveting those? I'm riveting, and I'm using an air riveting tool, which I've been using a riveter since I was 14 years old. I made a suit of armor that I wore to school out of roofing aluminum. Uh, and seven or 800 rivets. I built my toolboxes at Industrial Light and Magic out of rivets. Um, and I did all those with the hand rivet gun, which is a kind of a pump tool. Uh, this air-powered riveting gun is just such a luxury. And there, the drawer fits in really nicely. The backstop makes it really flush to the side of the box. Um, at this point, I'm really pleased with how well all the parts of the box are fitting together. And the gun's got a proper amount of headroom. Look at that. Yeah, you can already tell that once it's properly propped up, in the box, then it, it makes a great display. Yes. So now, in order to put the gun up, I'm going to use this material, which we call TruePan. That's its product name, T-R-U-P-A-N. 
Uh, it is a new growth pine uh, light density fiber board. If you've ever used MDF, medium density fiber board, you know it's really heavy stuff and cutting it, the dust is irritating, it's got formaldehyde in it. Uh, True Pen does not have a toxic binder in it. Um, again, it's made of new growth pine, it comes out of South America and it's one of the most useful materials we use in effects because it cuts well, it sands well, it's lightweight, uh, you can glue it, you can sand it, it's just great. It's really, really awesome material. And you can get it in all different sizes and shapes and it's a pretty big piece. Exactly, this stuff is a, an inch and a half thick uh, and I'm cutting it to size on my bandsaw, shaping it on my disc sander. Yeah, I'm running. I mean, it's, at this point it's pretty late in the day and I still have a lot of work <laughs> left to do. So there, that's the, that's the part that will hold the base of the gun, the butt of the gun. And I'm actually accommodating for the felt that I'm actually going to line that with later. Uh, and now this is a rough idea of what's going to hold the front of the gun. And I'm giving myself an idea and starting to shape that piece as well. Carving that small the piece for the, the handle of the gun, uh, that, was, that was pretty difficult. It wasn't easy just to get that, because you have to get it perfectly fit. It needs a kind of... Uh, really fit relatively that. perfectly fit. I mean, the thing is, is that the felt, again, is going to hide whatever crimes oh, of non-smoothness that have, have been left from my right. bandsaw. So now I've got the, stand, the two stand parts that hold the gun. I need to make a little chunk inside the lid mm -hmm. that will actually hold the gun in orientation. So now here's how fast I can really work when I set <laughs> my mind to it. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and you have a lot of workspace, and we can see the evolution of that workspace. Yeah. Throughout the day, you cleared out three big tables, and... I'm by, using by everything. End, I'm using, using every all surface. your surface. So this is uh, this is just some regular green felt that I got around the corner at Discount Fabrics, uh, and uh, I'm using Foam Fast 74, which is much more tenacious than Super 77, uh, and it's going to mean this felt one can move a little bit as I'm putting it down, and that's I'm waiting for it to set up, um, and it will hold literally forever. Yeah, it looks like silly putty when you spray it. Yeah, but there's a there's a Proper, silly string. Oh, silly string, yes. yes. Uh, and there's this whole process you have to wait for it to be ready to adhere, and then, but once it's stuck on, that's it. Once it's tacky instead of wet, mm -hmm. uh, you join two pieces together, they are going to hold for a really long time. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you can build Muppets this way with, uh, with uh, open cell foam and Super 74. So yeah, now I'm just like cutting out each of the pieces that we'll make. And what I found quite nicely that the felting worked beautifully to wrap around the edges. You can kind of massage it and pet it into the kind of submission you want. Now I'm felting the insides of the lids of the box. Again, all this is really kind of precise and busy work. It took a, it, it took a bunch of, it took a bunch more time than I thought it was going to take. There's a lot of surface area. Yeah, there's a lot of surface area to cover. I want to do the bottom of the bottom of the drawer, I want to do the top of the drawer, yeah. And, but the, the, the black and the green, they, they work well together. Didn't they? Yeah. I, I was really pleased with how that looks. You know, I, and I still need to do some more weathering on the green. It still looks a little too new. I may throw some fuller's earth on it. So there's me kind of massaging the felt into place, gluing in the butt for the gun. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's glued in, it's cleared underneath, so I've used uh, Scion Acrylate glue, uh, crazy glue, and that's never going to go away. That's just super, super strong. One thing I hope really comes across is how much fun you are having. It's a lot of busy work, but you are having so much fun building this box. I, this is my favorite kind of thing. Um, you know, starting off with a room full of materials and ending a day with an actual object that I coveted before that and now have, is, um, there's just there's few better feelings. It's why I'm a maker. You know, I, I, I desire that feeling. It's like a drug for me. And really now just coming together and using rivets as well. Yeah. And it's getting those hinges and that final piece of hardware. These, this is the hardware that earlier um, you kind of aged um, uh, with the blowtorch. Exactly. And the rivets allow me to, to, to put hinges in quarter inch wood uh, without popping through the other side, which means they won't interrupt the felt. They won't change the look of the thing. Um, in fact, uh, I'm putting crazy glue on each of those rivets in order to make sure it really grabs the wood and they really become one because it is not the most durable way to put rivets on just into wood. You normally want, if you want it to be really strong, put a backing plate on the other side, which is like a little washer for the rivet. So that's, I, every time I'm putting a rivet in, I'm putting a little cyanoacrylate glue on it in order to increase the amount of strength it's holding the lids together with. Yeah, and the, the now sun these, is setting, and yes. it's like an episode of those cooking shows. You have the, the clock yep. winding down. 
And and now I'm 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 working extra fast. If you were in the room, you'd notice at this point that I'm I'm go I'm almost picking up speed because I can smell the end coming. These butterfly closures are going in. Now I'm about to put some crazy glue on and pop the rivets in. And if you look at your hands, your hands have gone from you know from yeah. relatively clean to just you have there's band-aids. Yeah. There's glue all over them. I've been bleeding. There was a point at which I was bleeding all over the box. So now we're getting much closer. The handle, the placement of the handle in the middle, making sure it's at the balance point. I'll polish that handle a little later. You see the felt that's coming through every time I drill mm -hmm. through. Um, I don't mind dust getting into the box. That's all also going to be part of the weathering. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if the point is to have something that looks used, then yeah. this Precisely. all helps. So now, I mean, we're really, really close to it at this point. Um, most of the major chunks are there. This tall rivet I'm using to hold in this piece didn't actually end up being the way I held that piece in. It wasn't strong enough. There's a lot of strength required for that. So I ended up using screws. All right, so here we are. We are here. At the end of the day, um, it was a longer day than we thought. <laughs> um, You're I very ambitious. I started out this day thinking, oh, it's gonna be like three, three, four hours. It's been eight and a half hours. Oh my goodness. But it's you, a one day build. Yes, it's a one day build and it's magic that you turned pieces of wood <laughs> and paper and paint and stickers and this is the final thing. So let's show people exactly what this box is and how it works. All right, so uh, again, as you saw in the video, it started out as a plywood box, which I faced with paper from the art store. Um, now that I've added the brass fittings to, uh, to go with the hinges, etc., cetera, um, I've added some stickers. Now, because this is a Blade Runner pistol case. Mm -hmm. The stickers are part of the narrative of that. Um, I've got a County of Los Angeles sticker, which I hit with clear coat. Sometimes on boxes like this, back in the 30s and the 40s, they would have almost a decal attached to the box, so I wanted that sort of look. Um, I added uh, a Whalen yutani sticker because Whalen yutani is, yeah, sure. the Ridley Scott universe. Um, I added some, these are graphics from Sid Mead's original graphic test sheet for Blade Runner. So you went just in your computer, your pool of resources, all sorts of some archives. Decals out. Yeah, printed them out on sticky paper. I buy the uh, I buy the full sheet sticky paper, full sheet labels, and very specifically, I have a laser printer for doing this mm. because if you use an inkjet printer, you get really nice quality, but you can't touch it with paint or, or it'll was, run. Yeah, yeah. So the laser printer allows me to actually beat up the labels in a much more realistic way. I included a lion sticker on the back as if that's the maker. This is actually a, 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 a type of fuel or motorcycle or auto parts from way back in the day. Um, oh, Police 995, that is from, uh, that's from a Blade Runner mm -hmm. badge, Deckard's badge. And then over here, some Japanese. Um, these, I believe, if I, if I remember correctly, and I don't read Japanese, the Japanese symbols here, here, and here are actually from a manual for a Nambu pistol. So they would at least say yep. things like, here's how to use a Model 20, uh, something like that. So it's not completely off the mark. Uh, I'm really pleased with how the, the drawer, drawer came out. Its fit is just perfect. And drawers can be non-trivial in yeah, that Yeah, you put an extra layer of paper just to get the fit right. So yes. that gap would be filled. And it really, it really came off quite nice. I've got it filled, of course, with things from my Blade Runner universe, including Deckard's wallet and badge. Um, a test passport a friend of mine is printing up, but also um, Deckard's photos from oh, his goodness. piano. I've got, uh, these are nice replicas of all the photos you see. No unicorns. Pans. No unicorns. I have those in another box. Uh, the picture of him and his ex-wife and then uh, the Polaroid of Zora. Important memories. Important memories for, for Deckard as a replicant. Uh, now, let's crack it open, shall we? Absolutely. So I'm, uh, the, the, uh, I weathered most of these stickers with a double shot of espresso. Mm -hmm. And the placement is so important. Uh, you would spend time thinking about exactly where you want to put it. You can change your mind too. I did. I, I literally spent about 40 minutes just staring at it. I had the labels cut out. I'd cut them out in the morning. And I actually had a couple more that I didn't use. But once I started to distribute them, it turned out that a really light touch was what this case wanted. Hey, you can make all your plans you want about how you think it's going to look. Right, but once it's in your done, drawing, you had a giant Whalen logo. Yeah, and I just was, that was a sample to see how I'd want it to look. But once I put the Los Angeles sticker on it, I was like, this is a high level case without much adornment. Each of these things would tell a story about a time it went into storage or that somebody mm -hmm. shipped it or something like that. I really do think through all of that stuff. So 
Here's its primary display go. mode with the gun on display being held in by the, uh, by the little chocks up top. Um, I added some stamps in here as if there's some sort of registration stamp for a firearm perhaps that happened. The secret compartment comes off quite nicely. I've filled it with uh, my Blade Runner holster, extra magazines, which are actually part of, uh, 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 they're part of finishing this gun because this yeah. magazine is actually no good for a couple of reasons that no one cares about <laughs> but me. Um, and this is actually, uh, well, we'll you'll ammo. take some pictures. Ammo. I made my own ammo case, uh, made by Whalen Yutani for the P. Flager Series D Katsumata uh, blaster, and I included a stamp on it. Uh, also a, a seal, as if it was like officially sealed. So that goes in there. So uh, in fact, the Blade Runner pistol, like we've said before, is not done. No. So this box is not only a storage box for it, but it is actually housing all of the tools I need to both take it apart and put it all back together Dual again. Dual purpose. Dual purpose. Wow. Uh, no wonder you're obsessed with boxes. I couldn't be happier with this. This is the, this is the best object I've made in a long, long time. Um, I. I like the level of thrill that I feel right now is very, very high on the thrilled scale. I, I wrote an article for Wired last year where I said that when I start to weather something, there's a point at which I've got the weathering to a place that's just right and I stop imposing a story on the object and the object starts telling me the story that it's necessary to tell. Now you've birthed something and yeah. you gotta let it grow up. And I, 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 just, I couldn't be more happy with this, I really, I just love how it looks. And you'll take some pictures and we'll put them up. Absolutely, we'll put them Fantastic. on test.com. Yeah. And you know, we gotta do a, another video of just weathering. We will. People can look forward to in the future because that's that's where all your secret tricks come in. <laughs> it is, it is. I'm sorry we don't have those on camera this time. But again, really, I swear for stickers, take a close up of this. Double shot of espresso with, a, with even just your fingers can add so much because it's a lot of variance and it gives you a lot of different color depending on how thickly you put it on. Um, coffee just gives you something that paint kind of can't and I can still smell it. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you, Adam. And you'll find more pictures of this build and more footage from the cave on Tessa.com. I'm Norm. I'm Adam. We'll see you next time. See you next time. Bye.